But if you facilitate bottom-up transformation, it's much more adaptive and creative in and of itself because it's working with the self-organizing principles of complex systems. <laughs> Hey there, how's it going? This is James Tripp. This is a video for James Tripp Chaos Wave. We're gonna be looking in this video at something called genius mapping. I wanna give you my subjective take on why I think this is something really cool. And um, if you're wondering where I've been for the last week, it's because I've been on the genius mapping training with Jonathan Oldfeld in Orlando, Florida. Now, genius mapping is something which I had been introduced to previously by my good friend James Sakalos, and it was back then known as knowledge engineering. I want to tell you a little bit about what it is and especially the potential that I'm seeing in it, how I'm already using it. I've only been back from Orlando for two days. I've already been using this reasonably extensively and working with other people, working with myself, and it really is in a great many ways a missing link for me. So what is it? Um, Jonathan Oldfeld, if you don't know him, is an NLP trainer from the US and prior to studying NLP, he worked in the area of artificial intelligence, specifically programming expert systems. Now, this isn't an area of expertise for me, but it's, it's one approach to AI. If you're going to build an expert, expert system, that is a computer program that can diagnose, that can make decisions, that can make choices that would otherwise be made by a human expert. You have to get the understanding, the knowledge, you have to get the protocols from the expert first. Now the problem with this is when people are experts, they are operating at a level of unconscious competence. That means they do not know what it is they know. It means they do not know the criteria by which they make decisions. And so how do you get that stuff out? Some of it might, they might be conscious of, but much of it they're unconscious of. And this is something that Jonathan Oltfeld did for many, many years as his career before getting into NLP. Now, of course, the thing about NLP is the basis of NLP is modeling, okay? The idea is that there are people out there who have expertise. How do you model that? If you can pick the patterns out of them, you can install them in yourself, you can perform at that kind of high level. But one of the things that's often been left vague in the world of NLP is how to do that. How do you get that information out? And if you look around, there are a few different approaches to this. But as I understand it, and I'm kind of speaking for Jonathan here, when he came from the world of AI to NLP, he recognized he already had something really profound and strong in place for doing this. Uh, and that's something that he then nuanced up using his understanding of NLP. So this isn't quite exactly what he necessarily did when he was eliciting information from experts or eliciting knowledge from experts to program into these systems. It's been nuanced up with NLP. Now, that said, I've kind of called this video the missing link. And I wanna say why I'm calling this the missing link. And it relates to me personally and what I do. You may, as a subscriber to this channel, you may have engaged with uh, programs and trainings that I've put out in the past, on the hypnosis side, probably most likely, but possibly the self-hypnosis personal alchemy material, possibly the reality shape of deep craft material. In that, I've talked about my approach to self-change and self-transformation. Now, I'm aware that as I've been teaching that stuff, there's been some black boxes because I've been teaching from my own unconscious competence and I've tried to unpack that in myself. There's been black boxes in there. There's been bits missing where I've kind of hit a wall and people go, well, how do you do that? And I say, well, uh, uh, and I do my best to describe what it is that happens. And the place where this comes out the most is in relation to the concept of trance repertoires and the underpinnings of trance repertoires. Now, let me just recap this idea, just in case you haven't been exposed to it. Due to my experience with hypnosis and looking at how people respond and looking at the nature of experience and how behavior emerges from experience, I've long ago come to this position that at any given time in our lives, we are in one kind of trance or another, where trance is defined as any state of being from which automated behaviors 
emerge. Okay? So if you take trance as being any state of being from which automated behaviors emerge, you will recognize you're in one kind of trance or another all the time. I, right now, am in a video-making trance. I've got some information there in the background, but I don't actually know what I'm going to say next. I don't know what words are coming out of my mouth next. This is automated. This is kind of unconsciously driven, even though I'm consciously aware that it is happening. I am in my video flow trance right now. So, if we are in one kind of a trance or another at any given point, what is it that shapes those trances? What are the variables? What are the underpinnings of those trances? And if you've studied the self-hypnosis and personal algorithm material or the reality shape of deep craft material, you'll know that I talk about the semantic underpinnings of these things. So basically, underneath of a trance or a reality tunnel is another way I sometimes call it, you've got all these semantic structures, these belief structures, these meanings that underpin it and create it. We've got this kind of meaning set that sits underneath. Now, um, what I do when I'm doing self-transformation work, I look at my trances and I feel my way into the underpinnings. I use uh, Eugene Jenlin's felt sense and I allow semantic material to emerge from that. And then I have a kinesthetic check on whether that's congruent or not. And then I look at making adjustments. Okay. Now this is basically what I do. But now I've just described to you what I do. What would you do if you had to do that? How would you replicate what I've just said? I've given essentially what is a poetic description of an internal process. Okay. Now, when people have said, yeah, but James, how do I do that? The truth is I hit a black box. I know how I do it on the inside, but I cannot run a video camera on my inside processes. I can just do my best to describe them. So I've always hit this point in my teaching. Now, I also use this approach when I'm working with clients. So I listen to clients and I'm assessing what their trances are, what the trance repertoire is that pertains to the issue that they want to change. And I'm pulling out um, semantic pieces, bits that I think are uh, underpinnings for the trances, and I work immediately with them. But if I had to teach somebody how I do that, I would have a black box again, because I would say, I've just got an ear for it. I just get a sense, I've got a sense of how these things work. You know, and I do this thing I call Sherlock Holmes coaching. Now, when I'm doing the Sherlock Holmes work, I cannot give an explicit structure because it is based on years of experience, expertise, intuition, all of this kind of stuff. I've never had a structure for explicitly showing people how to do this before. And this is, for me, a place where this uh, genius mapping stuff is absolutely phenomenal. For the first time, I feel like I've gone over there and what I've been handed by Jonathan is a really explicit way of helping people get into the underpinnings of their trances. A really explicit way that can be really laid out, shown, taught, made really clear. And um, this isn't the way Jonathan thinks about this, by the way. This isn't his framing when, he, when I'm talking about getting into the underpinnings of trances. But if you think about it like this, genius mapping is about mapping expertise. Now you can look at any behavior anybody does as an expertise set including things that people call problems. Okay, they have an expertise set. The phobic, the spider phobic has an expertise set around freaking out and creating certain results when brought into the presence of spiders. There is an expertise set there, or you could say a trance that they drop into, and that has underpinnings, semantic underpinnings, rules that sit below the surface, belief systems that sit below the surface. So one of the fantastic things about this is it gives you tangible tools for mapping this stuff out, I think, in clients and in yourself. Now, self-facilitation is never easy with any process. That much is true. But I think of all the processes I've encountered, this is actually one of the easiest ones to run as a self-facilitation. I've been doing self-facilitating today with stuff. These are notes I've made around a self-facilitation that I've been doing today. Because I can do this on paper, it can help me stay focused as I'm pulling out underpinnings. I found, as I've done a self-facilitation today, around mapping out the underpinnings 
of um, my own trance structures or certain trance structures I'm looking to work with, I've found that it fits hand in glove with my organic natural means as well. And there are ways that it does with clients as well. So when you're, when, when you're working with yourself and you're getting into the underpinnings of your trance, one of the things I've talked about is using felt sense to get this kind of congruence check, this kinesthetic check. Yep, that's it, that fits. Jonathan talks about something he calls the full body nod when working with other people. It's an expression of this internal congruence, okay? When you're running back a, a structure, an underpinning that you've got from somebody about how they do a specific thing or what they're connecting up in their mind in that moment, uh, when you run it back to them and they're like, mm -hmm, that's it, their whole body expresses it. Why? Because they've got that kinesthetic congruence check going on. So this has kind of made explicit something that I've been implicitly doing with myself. And it's when I actually started self-facilitating with it that I recognized the parallels. Now there are differences between how I've traditionally done this. What I, I call uh, my method of doing it is speculative semantic modeling, okay? It's not the same as genius mapping or knowledge engineering. It's not the same thing. Um, genius mapping is more deductive in its approach. My approach was always more inductive. That means I'd start with the end, think about what needed to be there, and then do the congruence check on what needed to be there. Genius mapping works the other way around. Instead of starting with the end point and thinking what needs to be there, it starts by going in, into the system at any point and mapping outwards from that point. So it's more deductive and more emergent than my approach. But really, a lot of the same stuff is, is in the mix, but working from a different direction. Uh, also, what's really good about what Jonathan's got is an explicit structure in place that helps people learn this and work with it, which is something that I've never had because I developed it as an embodied skill set. So it's absolutely awesome from that perspective. I want to say something here. I don't want the video to run too long, but I do want to say something about working with clients and where I think this fits for people working with clients, particularly if they are coming in with a strong NLP influence. Now, um, Going back, if you go back in your NLP training, if it's a while ago, or maybe it's kind of fresh, there are certain ideas in NLP that crop up a lot, like this idea that uh, a problem can be considered to be an expertise set. This comes out a lot. And there's an old frame that Richard Bandler used to use, which was something along the lines of, of saying, look, if, I, if you had to disappear off the planet for a couple of weeks and you had to hire a temp to do your problem while you were away, and I was gonna be that temp, and if you were to teach me to do that, Teach me to do it now, you know, so I can do the problem. Now, this is an interesting frame from Richard Bandler, but you can chuck out that frame and it doesn't actually give you an expertise set for really mapping out what's going on uh, in the moment. Now, you could say, well, you know, we can go back to classic NLP strategy elicitation. I always found classic NLP strategy elicitation highly lacking, like as if we are just chains of stimulus response. And we are not. We are dynamic human beings. The old NLP model talks about tote loops. How are they mapped in a straight strategic sequence? They're not. But what genius mapping does is gives you a much richer way of pulling that information out, seeing how different variables affect outcomes. It's much more aligned with a tote loop and how a tote loop might work. Um, if you don't know about tote loops, I'm going to put a link up to a video about tote loops because I've done one before, so you'll see that around and about. So I think it's a much richer uh, system for doing this kind of mapping that was kind of there and implicit in that frame that Richard Bandler does. Now, another approach in NLP is like, well, you know, where do you do the problem? How do you do the problem? But where do you not do it and how do you not do it? What else do you do that might not be problem? And where might there be resources? Now, the interesting thing about genius mapping is you can map out a problem sequence of behavior in rich detail. Look at the variables that have it fire, that have it trigger. Get the structure of how it's built. You can do this, but you can also get the structure for resource states that may show up sometimes in its place or may show up somewhere else. You can get this stuff in such rich detail with all the variables in place that lead to the triggering and firing of it. You can now be really precise in your wiring work, or at least be informed as to where you might be really precise in your wiring work. So what I mean by that is if you take something like a swish pattern in NLP, typically the idea of a swish pattern is simply 
you've got a stimulus response going on and you tie that stimulus to a new link that, that takes it somewhere else, right? So it's, it's like switching the points on a railway track when you do a swish. Now, one of the reasons swishes often fail is because whilst a trigger was got, it might have sat within a set of variables that, that needed to be in a particular um, package but you pulled that one out and it might not have been the key variable. You might have had it tied to the wrong condition or an inappropriate condition or a weak condition rather than a strong condition within the set. So if you're gonna do that kind of wiring work, like with swishes and these sorts of things, what you get from genius mapping is you get the opportunity to do that with a much, much higher level of precision, a much higher level of precision. Or if you're looking at, uh, within a set, you're looking at a set of conditions, you can pick which one is gonna be the key one to collapse down if you wanna collapse anchors or something like this. You get a way higher level of precision. You're also gonna see belief structures that come out that you can start working with, uh, with the meta model or with slide of mouth or with these sorts of things. So what you've got is you've got a foundation here that can work to fire a lot of stuff off. Here's another thing that I've discovered, right? Because I've been back for a couple of days and I've been using this and it's phenomenal, is um, you can be working with somebody and you can get a, a nicely structured um, piece, which I'm gonna call here the underpinnings of a trance or you could call the structure of a particular behavioral sequence or whatever you wanna call it. Uh, and you're getting a rich structure, you can really go deep with, the, with getting the structure. But I have found that autogenic metaphors sometimes pop out or you can get autogenic metaphors for these structures and then start working with them in other ways. Now, by autogenic metaphor, I mean a metaphor that is generated by the client uh, spontaneously or with a little bit of prodding. Once you've got the metaphor, the metaphor can stand for a part. Any one of these sequences can be treated as a part. You can segue into parts work. The, the possibilities are infinite. But the thing that's wonderful about this is the, the genius mapping process, it provides a true chassis or an underpinning. Now I work pretty free form anyway, so I'll bounce from one thing to another, but I haven't found anything that I could go, yeah, that works as a base piece. Do you see what I mean? So it's very easy, for example, I'm, I'm well versed in symbolic modeling, clean language. It's very easy for me to bounce from an NLP pattern into symbolic modeling and clean language, but not so easy to go the other way around. The thing I think that genius mapping offers is a chassis, a starting point, where you can gather data in a rich way that is meaningful. It's not all left brain, okay? People are engaging, they're feeling into their system. You're getting those congruence signals. But you can bounce off in so many different ways. It is a phenomenal place to start a change work session because it's gonna suggest so many interventions. To me, it's just like this base point that shows me all these places where I could do a myriad of different interventions. And uh, I think it's phenomenal from that perspective. But there's something else inside of this as well. From a coaching perspective, okay, from a change work perspective, there's an interesting thing that seems to occur. And I wanna say I'm limited in my experience with this thus far, because I've done the training with Jonathan. And one of the great things about the training is you do a lot of the genius mapping. Okay, to start off with, it's quite technical. I had a difficulty getting my head around it to start with, but the way that Jonathan structured the training, you get into it through repetition. For me, it became very fluid, very easy by the end of the training. It's a six day training, by the way. Um, so it's very valuable from that perspective of really getting it in the muscle. So we did some coaching sessions, some change work sessions in the training with it, and I have done some since. And here's an interesting thing. Uh, if people remember the create instant change stuff or even the change work applications from hypnosis without trance, I think I talked there about the power of consciousness as a uh, learning and transformation faculty. The consciousness is not a doing faculty really, it's a learning faculty, it's a generative faculty. So when somebody shines the spotlight of consciousness on stuff they have not seen before, they make new connections. I believe this is the function of consciousness. And then from these new connections, difference emerges. So what you've got here with genius mapping is you've got something that even just working it in and of itself, you create a context for a lot of new connections to be made. I don't mean intellectual connections, hmm, that's interested. I mean real embodied shifts. 
you create a context for those to occur and um, for emergent change to happen, to come about. What I mean by emergent change is you're not necessarily, it's the old Steve Jobs thing, you cannot connect the dots looking forwards, only looking backwards. The current system is gonna think in terms of the current system. It's gonna think by the rules of the current system. Therefore, the solutions that the current system generates usually are um, reinforcing of the logic of the current system. But what happens if you step out of that, you bring like a slightly dissociated consciousness to it, you connect the pieces up differently, you have the opportunity for a solution to emerge that you could not have seen ahead of time. So I, I love the Steve Jobs quote, you cannot connect the dots looking forward, only looking backward. That's because looking forward, you can't see how things really need to be because the future hasn't happened yet and you're dealing with unknown conditions and unknown variables. But if you facilitate bottom up transformation, it's much more adaptive and creative in and of itself because it's working with the self-organizing principles of complex systems. Forgive me if that's a bit, but I've been talking a load of stuff about complex systems recently, and I will no doubt speak a lot more about that uh, in the future. Okay, I've had a small interruption coming in from the side. Maybe that's the universe intervening and saying it is time to wrap this video. I will say this. I think this is a phenomenally valuable training. Um, I will also say there's things I want to do with it. I haven't finished myself with this. There's a lot of explorations that I, I want to make, a lot of stuff that I want to unpack, new connections that I want to make. The way I tend to work with things, I'm not somebody that kind of necessarily learns something by rote. I like to learn from something and then see what I can discover with it. And this is one of the things I love about this genius mapping stuff because I think there is so much potential inside of this yet to be unpacked you can probably tell I'm quite excited about it. Um, so yeah, so check that out. If, if, you know, if this is something, if these words are resonating with you, you might want to check that training out. I strongly recommend it. Jonathan is a fantastic guy. It is a well-structured training, and it is something that is alive and in evolution as well. So there's quite an exciting buzz around it from that perspective. Um, so yeah, check out Jonathan's website, altfeld.com. If you book, by the way, if you do end up taking the training with Jonathan, do say that you came via this video, via James Tripp, because it is good karma to do so. Anyhow, aside from all of that, if you like this video, you know what you need to do. You need to give it the thumbs up, you need to like the video, um, or you get to choose to, at least. And if you are not yet subscribed to James Tripp Chaos Wave, then, the thing to do is to subscribe and hit the notifications bell. Hit that notifications bell because without that, you don't get told when the videos are coming in. The most important thing is the comments section. Please do leave your comments. Please do ask questions, share your perspectives because Chaos Wave is about an interaction. It is about a conversation. I want this channel to be here as a resource for you. So use that comment section as a way to drive the conversation. Until we speak again, keep on using your mind to shape your life.